Thank you, Anika, for this warm invitation. So the aim of this course is to actually share with you the strategies in the surgical management of a patient with a posterior polar cataract. Now, the fundamental pathology that we do have in a patient with a polar cataract is one, you've got an abnormal opacification at the posterior pole of the lens. You've got an abnormal adhesion between that opacity and the posterior capsule. And finally, we also have an abnormal inherent fragility of the posterior capsule. This, according to me, would be the ideal technique in each of each step. Now, we need to pay meticulous attention to detailing in not only the production of the main incision, but also of the side port incisions. You don't want something that's too narrow that results in difficult instrumentation, or too wide that results in a shallow chamber. Insufflation of the globe should be just enough to flatten the anterior capsule, not overpressurize the globe. The capsulorexis needs to be well centered and of a size approximately five millimeters, something adequate enough to allow for ease of nuclear emulsification, yet small enough to allow for the placement of a sulcus IOL should that be required. The crucial step is the hydrodelineation, which actually creates the endonucleus, which is sub subsequently emulsified, but also creates the epinuclear barrier which supports the PC. Nuclear emulsification should be with low flow settings and with minimal manipulations in the bag followed by a visco-BSS exchange. Then we perform a hydro-visco delineation of the, of the epinucleus up to the posterior pole, which allows for loosening of the epinucleus, which is then subsequently removed, again in very gentle settings with the epinucleus mode of the ultrasound. Again, at the end of this, we do a visco-BSS exchange to prevent shallowing of the chamber. Then we perform an IA. Now, the irrigation aspiration, according to me, I prefer with a bimanual IA because it allows for circumferential removal of the cortex. What's very important to remember is that when you then plan to remove the viscoelastic, uh, when you plan to then remove the source of irrigation in the eye, as you see here, you always do a visco-BSS exchange. The IOL insertion in these cases, again, needs to be done uh, gently under a viscoelastic barrier. Make sure that the removal of the viscoelastic should not entail vigorous rock and roll movements of the IOL. If you do need to wash behind it, I tend to lift up the optic anteriorly with the aspiration and wash gently with the irrigation behind. And finally, I do not bring the irrigation out. I, I hydrate the main and the side port incisions the best I can, and then finally remove the source of irrigation and do a quick hydro, uh, um, hydro of the last wound. Now, since the nuclei are different, the, so also the nucleus management strategies may also be different in these polar cataracts. And here are a few. Typically, we end up operating on cataracts with fairly early nuclear sclerosis. So a cataract like this, having done the hydro delineation, literally in the foot pedal too, or in the epinucleus mode, you can just end up aspirating the entire nucleus gently in the central part with minimum manipulations in the, ace, in the, in the bag, followed by a visco-BSS exchange. Here's another case. So you do the hydro delineation. Here the nucleus pops up. If it pops up, you take advantage of the fact that it's popped up, and you go ahead and aspirate the cataract. Now, as the cataracts get gen generally a little denser in the center, here again, it's a pretty soft cataract. Having delineated the endonucleus, you've lifted it up, and now you do a tilt and chop. You hold it, and you just keep chopping, after which the epinucleus is removed. The next case, of, again, of nucleus management, you can see the surgeon actually thinks it's pretty soft and attempts to just hold on to it and bring it up, it doesn't happen. So then the surgeon ends up doing a, uh, a sculpt. Having sculpted out a little groove, you then hold and do a chop. Now, it is a lateral separation, a chop in situ with a minimum lateral separation. And then without rotating, you do another chop on either side, create the fragments. Once you've created the fragments, you bring the fragments out. Now you're good to actually either rotate the nucleus or literally the one end, one half, and the other half are then elevated and then subsequently emulsified with a FACO2 with settings which are suitable for that particular case. 
Now, as the cataracts get harder, when you're doing a hydro delineation, it may be a little challenging. But having achieved the best hydro delineation possible, again, you do a direct chop with a limited lateral separation. And here, either you chop, as I did in the previous case, a surgeon attempted lifting up the fragment, didn't really come up, gone to the other side, done a tiny chop, removed a fragment after which the subsequent emulsification is literally like any other case. So the, 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 the main thing is just keep your settings controlled and keep it gentle. Now, having seen the ideal technique, here are a few things that you definitely do not do. One, in this particular case, I'm just giving you a few examples. The chamber is actually shallowing because the tunnel is so short that during IA, there is a constant aggressive fluid. Now, this would not happen if you did take care to make a nice shaved incision. Second, even by mistake, even accidentally, even forgetfully, you never, like in this case, the surgeon actually accidentally does a hydro dissection. Now, that has the propensity of having the wave go right behind and open up the posterior capsule. When you are doing a direct horizontal chop, especially for the slightly harder cataracts, you never do this. You never have such a wide separation, a lateral separation. In this case, the surgeon has such a wide lap lateral separation, then actually yanks the nucleus around, which would otherwise be safe in a normal, uh, in a normal cataract, then performs the second chop. And finally, when he attempts to now rotate the nucleus to do the third job, he notices that just those maneuvers have resulted in opening up of the posterior capsule. So the, the other mistake here is the surgeon attempts, this is a video from over six years ago, wherein a uh, 26 number needle is introduced into the plas plana with a view of trying to save those fragments and bring them up. Today, I would state that this is definitely a no-no. Any introduction of a needle to try and save the nucleus from going down is going to cause significant damage to the vitreous base with the propensity of creating whole stairs, a detachment, and a macular edema later. So this should also be avoided. And finally, as I mentioned throughout this course, when you are doing either a FACO or a uh, IA, like seen here, at the end, Whenever your source of irrigation is coming out, you have to be ready with a visco at the other hand. This is another mistake where at the end of the IA, the surgeon has just introduced both the instruments. And finally, even when you're removing the visco at the end of, of, uh, of uh, visco wash after the IOL is inserted, you can actually see the IOL lifting up if you've not done a hydro of the wound and therefore it should be avoided. I now come to the last part of my talk where we address the open posterior capsule, different scenarios, and the way they can be managed in a polar cataract. So the case one is you see when the nucleus is being emulsified. At the end of nuclear emulsification, you can see that little white ring underneath. Now, that is not an opening in the posterior capsule, but however, it is just a condensation of the posterior cortex, which is fairly typical, and I've seen it very often. On the other hand, when you actually see this, you can actually see a bowing of fish mouthing, which signifies an open posterior capsule. Here, towards the second half of eye, the surgeon notices the typical you know, elliptical equator to equator and uh, opening in the posterior capsule. But since there is no vitreous disturbance, the surgeon is able to even put a one-piece uh, Zeiss lens carefully uh, uh, in the confines of the bag after using a dispersive viscoelastic before the injection. Here, everything's going well, but you can notice the typical fish mouthing towards the end of nuclear removal, which signifies that there is an opening. The surgeon does the right thing by doing a visco BSS exchange. However, notices it spontaneously enlarges. So the surgeon then performs a limited anterior vitrectomy after having cleared the vitreous in the disturbed area with a cut eye. With the eye cut mode, the surgeon then goes ahead and removes all the cortex in a circumferential manner, first from this side and then the other, after which an IOL is placed. The next is a case where you can see a pupillary snap happening and the surgeon notices that in this grade 3 polar cataract, there seems to be a propensity of the pupil of the nucleus dropping. So the surgeon brings the nucleus into the AC, but this again today is what I would suggest is not a good idea because the corneal endothelium, I mean the support is of the small pupil, but it's best just letting it drop 
and managing it later on. Here's a heart catheter to patient with a grade 3 nuclear sclerosis. Emulsification seems to be going well. And then the surgeon notices the last fragment, which is still in the bag, is now starting to sink. So what you don't do is you don't go after it. Put in some vis dispersive viscoelastic. The surgeon emulsifies the last bit of nucleus, after which a visco BSS exchange is done. Everything was done well. Still, there was a disturbance in the vitreous, for which a limited anterior vitrectomy was done, after which we did not have a three-piece lens. We extended it to a 5 mm and put in a rigid lens in the sulcus, after which, before you hand over to the retina surgeons, you make sure you tighten all the incisions. And that's my last video. Uh, you never do a capsule polish in patients with a polar cataract because there still is a propensity of a rent. Now here there's been a localized opening with, with the help of an interocular forceps. It's converted to a round circular opening after which the surgeon actually places a three-piece lens in the careful confines of the capsular bag. And finally, it's not over till it's over. Even a stromal hydration has the propensity in a polar cataract to result in a disruption of the posterior capsule, which is seen here. The patient, the surgeon actually didn't notice this, a friend's video, and at the end, saw it the next day. With this, I come to the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for a patient hearing. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Suvira. Just one question, what are your thoughts on flax in uh, posterior polar cataracts? Because a lot of talk has been there on the advantages of flax. Okay, so my experience with that is limited. However, I think if you're careful with respect to where you create your breaks, how you define what your endonucleus is. Once you've got that measurement right and you define, one, of course, the rexus is going to be perfect, round, centered, wherever you want it to be. The only challenge is whether you end up damaging the posterior capsule. So all the rest of the steps, like removal of the epinucleus and all, would be the same like in manual. But if you can define with your flax what should be your endonucleus where you make your breaks, then you should Yes, be definitely we can. Actually, as you said rightly, the rexus is the most perfect and most consistent. And beyond and that, you can actually uh, optimize your settings so that you can increase your epinuclear shell and the cushioning yes. is better. Yes. So that gives a greater safety and on during the femto you can actually see with the OCT whether there is a pre-existing posterior capsular dehiscence. So that also helps. Or at any point you're creating an interoperative dehiscence. Yeah, because when you're doing the femto you can see because as the OCT is Absolutely. going on you can actually scan and you can see that. So that is another advantage. And I think it will be even more advantageous in a, in a more denser cataract because in these denser cataracts it's yes, a little challenging doing getting the hydro delineation correct, right. Correct. There's always an accident uh, a chance of it going behind so in that I think it would so be because you can't advantage. rotate and you can't hydro uh, yes. dissect yes. so this gives the uh, advantage even in that so. Dr. Abhay Vasavda has also postulated the theory of his uh, femto delineation where they make cylindrical uh, nuclear uh, pieces so what I feel is that, uh, there is a pneumatic dissection yeah area. Uh, then you get a pneumatic delineation and then you inject fluid, the fluid finds that space and, and creates that. Yeah, so hmm. the biggest advantage in flax is that there's a pneumatic dissection. Yeah. Whenever you do any hydro procedure, it finds that space and gets a fluid by rolling. Correct. So you don't need to create another space and you're far away from the posterior. And you've actually so measured where it yeah, has to be. Yeah, so normally if you have the posterior settings as 500, here you would keep it at 900 or 1,000 microns. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, that was very good. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Sandeep Nagwekar, sir, for his uh, talk on management of uh, dense brown cataracts. I'd like to invite Dr. Kumar, doctor, here on. Dr. Suvira, please come. Parkar, sir. Yeah. Inviting uh, Dr. Haldipurkar, sir, please come on the dais. Please come. Please, please. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. No, no, please, please. Sir, please come. Dr. Sandeep Nagwekar is a brilliant surgeon from Bombay, and uh, he'll be speaking to us on uh, management of dense brown cataracts. Uh, thank you, Anika, for this invitation. 
Uh, so I have no financial disclosures for any of the products mentioned or implied in this presentation. Now all of us have at some stage or the other come across these dense hard brown cataracts in our OPD. And the first reaction which happened to me when I was a resident was a thing of shock because we all know that this one is a tough nut to crack. And uh, what are the concerns out here? The main problem that we are concerned about is of the potential damage that we can occur to the posterior capsule. We can uh, dislocate some of the zonules. Uh, we can cause damage to the cornea. And of course, most of these hard brown cataracts are associated with uh, some comorbidities or the others, like weak zonules. Some have got thin posterior capsule with strong corticocapsular adhesions. There is a compromised endothelium in many of these old patients who have waited for a very long time. Pseudo-exfoliation is another thing that's very common with these heart cataracts. And of course, they have a lot of systemic comorbidities. Many of these patients are hypertensives, diabetics, on blood thinners for a long time. The concern about uh, an open uh, globe as well as an expulsive hemorrhage, all these things and uh, thoughts come to mind. And of course, the basic principle in any cataract surgery when we are doing FACO, the main thing is that you need a nuclear disassembly. And that can be done by any of the methods, but for those who are venturing into heart cataracts the first time, probably the stop and chop is the most efficient and the safest method as far as this thing is concerned. Uh, as we mentioned in our previous talk, femtosecond laser again comes to our rescue in most of these difficult situations in cataract surgery. What it does in case of heart cataracts is, of course, ensures there's a perfect uh, central uh, capsulorexis. It creates planes of cleavage so that there is easy to disassemble the nucleus. Uh, it also leads to minimal stress on the zonules because you aren't using too much energy out here. And of course, it also softens the cataract by using the fragmentation mode. Uh, now, this is the first case. This is a straight grade four cataract that we are doing. And the first thing that is very important in all these cases is that you must make a long, deep, and a wide trench. Remember, one should not be afraid of trenching deep in these cases because most of the time the cataract is very hard. You like to make a wide trench so that you're, as, as you're going in, the tip along with the sleeve can get to the bottom. Splitting once you are able to go down right to the uh, posterior edge is quite simple. This is a case of a femto. So as you can see, that those uh, planes of cleavage have already been created. This ensures that perfect uh, separation takes place. Uh, you see that most of the work is done by the chopper in the left hand. There's not much that you have to do with the right hand except to hold the nucleus very high. And what one uh, tip I would give you is that make sure that when you're using hard cataracts, you're using high vacuum to hold because if you use high vacuum and hold these pieces well, chopping becomes very easy. So typically my setting for this uh, during the chop mode, the for holding the nucleus, I would use about 600 or even 700 millimeters of mercury. Not so much of uh, vacuum when you are aspirating the piece, but uh, it makes sure that uh, you have good uh, planes of cleavage. So once you have achieved that the, and you have managed to separate, and of course make sure that you separate it all the way down to the, to the bottom, right, right to the tip of the uh, posterior capsule at the, uh, uh, at, uh, right in the center. And then, as you can see, there's not much work to do with the chopper in this particular case, which is a grade four, because uh, you know you are using uh, torsional along uh, with a longitudinal. A combination of that ensures that the fragment remains at the tip, and uh, so therefore it becomes easy to aspirate the nucleus and uh, make sure that everything goes well. But this is one of the easier cases, I would say, that where uh, the the cataract is not very dense. It's maybe early grade four, but it, it was hard, as you can see. You know. Of course, the use of the femto made sure that uh, it was very simple and very easy to make. And of course, uh, one thing we have to ensure always is keep the chamber stable because you're afraid about causing any potential damage to the corneal endothelium. So do not use very high vacuum when you're aspirating those pieces. At that time, the typical vacuum setting would be about 350 millimeters of mercury. And that should be enough. A flow rate of about uh, 30 as well as um, uh, a bottle height of about whatever you normally use, about 80 to 100. In this particular case, I was using a centurion, so maybe uh, talk in terms of, uh, now this is the next case. Um, now this is a denser than that. In fact, this is a 72-year-old uh, lady gynecologist, and uh, you can just see that uh, the cataract was uh, quite hard. If, uh, the, when the posterior capsule is not uh, visible, it's very, uh, easy to make a mistake. If you do a violent hydrodissection, there can be a blowout of the PC. So make sure that you do a gentle multi-quadrant hydrodissection. 
Again, make sure you go deep down till you see those leathery fibers at the base. When you see those leathery fibers at the base, uh, uh, it's not uh, sometimes uh, a problem to even uh, FACO in that area so that you, know, you have a really, really deep trench out there. Uh, of course, uh, separating again, when you're separating again, you make sure that you hold with a very high vacuum. This ensures that uh, basically you do not slip. The piece tends to slip if you do not hold it properly. Once you've done that, you have to make sure at the same time that you don't stretch it too much because you're laying stress on the zonules. And that's where the stop and chop becomes a good method because you're always leaving some kind of space in the center and creating that space in the center does not lay too much stress on the zonules. Otherwise, in a very tight bag, a very tight nucleus with hardly any cortex out there, you can sometimes cause damage to the zonular complex. Uh, once you have done that, most of these cases ultimately then become very easy. As you can see, as opposed to the first case, a lot of work is done by the chopper in the left hand now. For one, it helps to get the nuclear material to the phaco tip. And the second thing is that when you're using a combination of a torsional and a longitudinal, it also uh, is useful to help the nucleus remain a little away from the phaco tip because you need just the tip of the nucleus at the shearing plane if you stuff too much, it's easy to clog the nucleus, and all the time you have to take the handpiece out to kind of uh, remove the clogged material that gets clogged over there. So you just bring it in and then keep it away. You know, I would compare it like to the seal in the circus who's balancing the ball on the tip, and you think that he's balancing it on the tip of his nose, but all the time he's moving the nose to keep that tip just bobbing up and down, and this will ensure that the nucleus remains over there without flying off to the endothelium as sometimes it happens and with potential damage over there. The use of a soft shell uh, is very important in these cases. I always put in chondroitin sulfate, that's viscoat, uh, right in the uh, front in, uh, against the endothelium, and below that at the base is helon so that it ensures that there's a good fragment right uh, towards the end. Now, Sometimes you get a case where you, you don't have a well dilated pupil, and as you can see, the, then in that case, femto is not possible. You have to go the conventional method. I, as you can see in this case, I've used a, 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 a malignant ring. You can also use a BHEX ring. My choice of the ring depends on how rigid the pupil is. If it's a rigid pupil, I'd prefer a malignant. If it's not so rigid, then maybe I would put in a BHEX, and I think that works pretty well also. Of course, the dilatation you get with the malignant is a little better as compared to the BHEX, but no particular preference out here. Again, as you can see, those leathery fibers, you go deep down to the base, and then, of course, ensure that uh, the separation takes place. Now, I just heard the bell, so in the interest of uh, time, I will move over this case, which is more or less a repetition of that. But in this case, uh, the only thing that was very stressful is was a 90-year-old, a one-eyed patient, and uh, he had lost his first eye due to uh, vitreous loss and retinal detachments in the previous eye, hesitated about doing the second eye till his son was a radiologist, uh, literally forced his dad to come on the table. So we had a very anxious patient who had been given a little sedation, but we somehow managed to do the case. And as you can see, we had even planned for a toric lens, and I'm happy to say that this person enjoys 6 unaided vision today. So I'll just move on to the last case, which I thought I will share with you because it's very important. So sometimes you have another one-eyed patient here who's lost his second eye, and now this is such a dense cataract that I, I didn't dare to uh, think of doing a FACO. And remember, we should leave our egos aside and not stick to FACO for every patient. So I attempted a small incision cataract surgery with a good outcome. As you can see out here, after we have done a large rexus, uh, uh, you know, the classical uh, wave that we like to see, we ensure First of all, the uh, lens moves, and then, of course, uh, put in that fluid wave so that the pole pops up from the other side. As you can see, the wave of hydro dissection moves against the posterior capsule, and uh, we're just waiting, yes, and then it pops out. And once it pops out, it's not that difficult. You rotate it around and uh, spin the lens out of the capsular bag. Once the lens has come out in the capsular bag, I injected uh, visco underneath the lens that ensured that I was going to do a visco expression, use a vectus to engage the nucleus in the wound, but the nucleus was very large. It wasn't coming out. And of course, then at that time, I remember those gynecologists who used to have those difficult deliveries, and they used to thump on the fundus of the uterus from the back. So here you can see I can go from the side port and push that nucleus into the wound. And once it is into the new, with using the same 26 gauge needle that was used for the capsular rexus, got that entire nucleus out. And of course, I didn't lose my chance to uh, 
uh, to give him a refractive result. As you saw, despite everything, I decided I'm going to use a toric lens. I had calculated my SI to be about 1.5 for a large incision like that, and I put in a toric lens, and I managed to get a good refractive result in this patient. So uh, that's all that I'd like to basically tell you. Most of these things require a lot of patience. You should take a lot of time over these hard cataracts. Don't keep them in a very, uh, when you're very tight for time. You should do these cases slowly, gently, and I think we can all have a very good result as far as this. Uh, this was literally the end of this uh, procedure, and the case was closed with a coaptation with the help of Cotri. Thank you so much, very much for your attention. These are a few points which I went through uh, during the course of the talk. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sandeep Nagvika. Uh, actually, one more thing I wanted to ask you regarding the rexis. Uh, any specific preference for a slightly larger excess yes, uh, in yes. these I cases? Always, uh, I always attempt a larger excess about between 5 to 5.5 millimeters is my choice of excess. I won't go larger than that. Not larger than would, that. Yeah, but, uh, but about 5.5. Yes, yeah. Compared to a routine case or yes, compared to course, a posterior yes, polar yes. where we mentioned around Unlike, 5. But many of these heart cataracts have small pupils also, so sometimes you need to put yeah, a ring. Yeah, we can't really. But uh, yeah, you must have a larger excess. It makes the uh, job much easier. Yeah, definitely. Can, that was an excellent talk and lovely videos. Uh, I'll be now speaking to you all about uh, small pupils. So, so that uh, brings us to the uh, question about how small is really small. Uh, for an accomplished surgeon, as you become more and more experienced, probably the threshold goes on reducing. So you may feel two, three, or four millimeters uh, to be a really small. So it also depends on the intraoperative situation and how the iris tissue properties are and how the iris behaves, how the pupil comes down on table. And there are a variety of reasons why you would have a patient with a small pupil. So this has to be done. Uh, the thought has to come to you in the OPD when you're actually seeing the patient. So it could be just a senile uh, um, pupil which, uh, or a rigid pupil which doesn't dilate or a chronic diabetic. Patients having pseudo exfoliation, definitely you need to be more careful and tell them and also remember that there could be a zonular weakness. IFIS is one thing which is important. So in your history, we need to remember, you need to ask about specific drugs that the patients are taking. You could have a patient having recurrent uh, uh, uveitis and posterior sinicae, which has now brought down the pupil, or an old trauma or old surgery that has been done. Patients of chronic glaucoma who are on long-term myotics definitely have small pupils, and we need to be prepared to manage them. So the main technical challenges here are there is a reduced visibility, and that causes problems at every step and at every stage. So you could have damage to the iris. You could have a very small CCC, and that is why some problems delivering the nucleus and doing fake or you may be catching the anterior capsular rim or retained lens material you may have left behind some kind of cortex in the periphery or the IOL placement could be difficult so you could end up having a PC rupture and finally a poor visual outcome and an unhappy patient. So what we need to do is we need to plan at each step of our surgeries not only in the preoperative screening, the techniques, keep our FACO settings also in such a way that you have a lesser vacuum, low flow rates, and be ready with good OVDs and pupil expansion devices. So this is a stepwise approach that we usually follow. If the pupil has not been dilated well just before the surgery, and then you feel that there are a lot of adhesions, then you might go in with a pupil stretching. Many uh, uh, surgeons are not preferring this technique now, but this was what we did earlier. So first is you break out all the sinicae and then free the edges, and then decide whether you, whether you really need a pupillary expansion device at all. In these cases, sometimes with the pupillary stretching, you might be able to get a slightly larger sized uh, pupil, which could be adequate enough, so you don't really need a pupillary expanding device in such cases. So as you can see here, now we have switched on to the SCI mode that gives a very good glow, especially in small pupils. You need a very good uh, glow so that you have good visibility. Sometimes the pupil can still come down during the course of the surgery. So the rexis has to be such that it's just below or just inside the uh, pupillary edge. This was a patient who was an uh, old uh, glaucoma surgery operated. You can see the PBI also there. And the case went off well. And this was post-op day one, 6-6, six, six, unaided. And the pupil was nice and round. 
Now there are cases like this where you have an aderent leukoma, hypermature cataract. So you cannot use any kind of pupillary expanding devices in these cases because inferiorly it's not going to expand much. And here we have stained the anterior capsule with trypan blue. Again, as you can see the rexis, it is just inside the pupillary edge. You need to be careful because it's already a mature cataract. You can easily get a, a runaway and then that could lead to a problem because visibility in the periphery would be difficult. Uh, you need to remain in the center during the FACO so that you don't uh, inadvertently catch the pupillary edge. So finally you are able to manage the um, nuclear uh, FACO emulsification, the irrigation aspiration and the lens is in place. You need to use also a lot of intracameral agents like phenocaine and OVDs. Remember OVDs are very good to keep the pupil dilated, especially something like Helon 5, a very heavy viscoelastic, but they need to be replenished and they can easily uh, come out during the course of the surgery. You need to replenish them. And in case all these doesn't work, you go on to a pupillary expanding device. So to, to the left, you have those that we are using routinely, the iris hooks, the Melugan ring, and the BHEX. There are a lot of other rings also that are available. Uh, depends on your comfort zone. Now, these are two eyes of the same patient of pseudo exfoliation. To the left, we haven't used any kind of pupillary expanding device because we thought that we would be able to manage. To the right, we thought the pupil was not as adequate and hence we used iris hooks. Now when you're using iris hooks, usually we use four of them. You have a fifth one also available and you can uh, put it in a diamond shaped configuration. You need to remember that as you're inserting the iris hook, it has to be done laterally, very gently and then uh, along the iris ma margin and then you have the stopper there so that you keep them dilated. Remember, do not pull on the iris edge too much because that can cause sphincter tears. Now to the left, as you can see, the pupil is not really very well dilated, but just enough for the surgery. If it was still smaller, then it could cause more stress because the surgeon may not be very comfortable. So it all depends on your comfort level and how you are able to manage. Once the rexis is done, then it becomes very difficult to put in iris hooks. So that decision should be taken ideally uh, much before you actually go in for the surgery. So this is the post-operative picture. I have kept on purpose both the eyes. You can see with the iris hook, sometimes if you have pulled a lot, you can cause uh, sphincter tears and an irregularly uh, shaped pupil. Now some of the, sometimes you can have a sharp iris retractor uh, tip. So when you're actually pulling on it, you need to be careful. If you're in a hurry, then you may inadvertently tear the anterior capsule, as you can see here. So you need, as you can see here at the edge. So that also is an important factor. Now the second one is the Malugin ring. Now it's basically um, a ring like this where it is preloaded. So there is a hook onto it and then it, the scrolls are very gentle and then they hold on to the iris uh, edge. So this is how it is basically inserted and this was a case, a one-eyed patient uh, who had lost the other eye due to glaucoma. This I also was a, a trap already done. You can see the trypan blue that has stained even the bleb. So you just hook on to the uh, Malugin ring and then uh, it comes into the injector and then you inject it very, very gently each of the scrolls the leading one and the two, uh, the proximal and the nasal and the temporal. If you're lucky, you can put all the four at one shot, but you need to be very, very gentle with them. And uh, inserting it, it's not really that difficult at all. And once you do that, you have a very good uh, adequate dilatation and then rest of the procedure is the same. An advantage is it uh, dil uh, dilates or expands the pupil in the same plane. So there is no, sh uh, unlike iris hooks, there is no shallowing of the anterior chamber in the periphery. Uh, now going on to the BX pupillary expander, it has basically six notches that engage the pupil, six flanges. Now each of these flanges are uh, in the form of a hexagon, so you have flanges without the hole that go above the iris and with the hole that go behind the iris, but it can be the other way around as long as they are uh, the alternate ones. Now this was a patient with a floppy iris who uh, we were uh, planning a multifocal IOL, so you see how the pupil has come down. So it was a wise decision to go on with a pupillary expanding device. Now this is a very thin ring, so as you insert it with a 23 gauge forceps, the uh, two side ports are used for the two uh, side uh, flanges and then uh, it gives a good hexagonal uh, opening of the pupil. You can then go in and do your uh, routine uh, rexis, the uh, gentle hydrodissection and uh, the nuclear 
uh, FACO emulsification. Now, because of its very thin profile, it can be even uh, inserted through the side port. Some people have also used uh, flax along with this procedure. Once the intraocular lens has been inserted, removal is very, very easy. You use the 23 gauge forceps, just disinsert it, and then pull it out. So it's a very simple uh, device to use, and it's very gentle on the uh, pupillary edge. And this was the patient post-op day one, 6, 6, and 6. So if you're thinking of IFIS, it's very different from the routine small pupil that we have. So some people have also recommended uh, pre-surgical topical atropine. Definitely you can use intracameral epitrate and viscoadaptives. But what is important is a very careful wound construction. It should not be too short enough because that could cause repeated iris prolapse. A very gentle hydrodissection. And remember that the currents during the irrigation aspiration uh, should be such that they are not directed at the uh, iris uh, pupillary edge. Sometimes you can use a fifth iris retractor just underneath the uh, wound uh, in such cases of IFIS and definitely pupillary expanding devices. What does not work is stopping the flow max because that does not reverse the IFIS at any way and pupillary stretching sphincterotomies should be avoided. Do not overfill the AC also with OVDs. Now this was an interesting patient. We just did the um, uh, Rexis, you can see here the pupil is quite well dilated. So uh, we definitely we didn't think of any pupillary expanding device. Now, once the Rexis was done, and I thought I would start with the hydro dissection, and before I even did that, you can see how the pupil started coming down for no reason. In fact, I thought that the sister had given me pilocarpine uh, instead of uh, a routine BSS. And no matter what I did, even epitrate, the pupil didn't expand at all. So remember here, the rexes had already been done, but now we could not go ahead with a very small pupil like that. So we put a B-hex now. And uh, very, very gently, because we do not want to uh, pull on the uh, anterior capsular rim. So this was done, and then we went ahead with the uh, other procedures like the uh, hydro dissection and the rest of the procedures. As you can see here, the superficial cortex and the epinucleus being emulsified and uh, the nucleus. So the rest of the uh, uh, steps are the same. Now this was another patient with a pupillary membrane and it's a very, very uh, small pupil. And in fact, in such cases, you can also go ahead and do um, use iris hooks. Now, if you have a very small pupil like this, then to be, before you use any kind of BX pupillary expander, then you need to slightly stretch the pupil so that it will be more easier. So we are doing a small uh, pupillary stretching here. I thought there would be a fibrous membrane and we would be able to remove it, but it was quite uh, uh, adherent and stuck to the pupillary edge, so we just left it. Now, uh, here is the BHEX uh, ring that we are placing in the pupillary edge, and it's a very irregularly shaped and uh, friable kind of edge. Uh, so you can see here how the rest of the procedure is almost the same, and then we would go ahead and remove the BHEX uh, ring very, very gently. At the end of the procedure, you could see how there is an irregularity at the edge, but that was because the pupil was totally stuck. This was the post-op, vision was quite good, 6-9. Uh, differences between the Melugin and the BHEX, definitely the Melugin is more expensive, but more importantly, it's biplanar, whereas the BHEX is uniplanar and jointless. So that gives a better, uh, uh, and it's very, very thin profile, so it's slightly uh, better, but people have their own preferences. So you can easily use the Melugin ring also. It depends on your comfort level. So you have different kinds of devices giving you different kinds of uh, the, uh, sizes of the pupil. It all depends on what you are comfortable with. Now, if you're thinking of flax in a very small pupil, if you have a very small pupil, say less than uh, 4.5 millimeters, then it would probably not be a very wise decision to go in with the flax. Maybe you could use a Melugin or a BHEX and then go in and do flax. Now, however, once you do a flax, remember that because of the photochemical photo disruption, you could have prostaglandin release and meiosis. Now, people have used Melugin rings also and gone ahead, changed the settings and then done a FEM2 and then come back to the main OR and remove uh, the um, cataract. Now, this was a patient where we did a FEM2 earlier and then we went ahead and then put a BHEX. So, you can see already the capsulotomy has been done. It's a slightly smaller one and it was a toric lens. 
So once this was done, it was a, a free floating uh, capsulotomy, so that was easily removed. And we could, because the nucleotomy is also done, so it's not so difficult, and the entire procedure was done well. So you can see the pupil was really small, but we had a good uh, outcome. So to conclude, today we have increased patient's expectation and use of premium lenses. So with optimal use of devices, definitely we can overcome the challenges of small pupil and give good visual outcomes. Thank you so much. So when you did your flax in a small pupil, uh, you did a small rexus and then you put a toric eye also, you expanded the rexus? After no, there was no need for that fortunately. But I thought I would but it was not that small. When I actually went in well, and… Well, I would be little… Yeah, I would… Yeah, it was small but… Uh, then you wouldn't be worried about capsular contraction in the future? Could be, but in this case, I, during the surgery it was quite comfortable so I didn't want to remove it. And did you put in a… Endocapsule, I thought it, it was, was around 4. Yeah, 3.94. 4, 4. So you basically you make it as pupil maximized. So when you do that, it comes to 1 millimeter inside the pupil no matter what size. So you don't have to actually yeah. size it. So you have an option of pupil maximized. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, can make yeah, anything. Yeah. What about lens X? It can make 2.9, it can make anything. What is the least you can make? Huh? 4.2. Okay. Any comments, uh, Haldipurkar sir? Yes. Yeah, uh, inviting Dr. Ashish Vaidya, a prolific uh, veterinary surgeon. He will be speaking to us on uh, managing PCRs. Good morning. My topic for today is vitreous loss in cataract surgery. One often wonders whether the vitreous is my friend or whether it's my enemy because it helps me in certain cases like a sterile buckle, but at the same time it causes problems like a retinal detachment. And one must remember that vitreous loss is the commonest complication of cataract surgery irrespective of the technique. There are certain high risk factors which are there. You may have young patients, there may be positive vitreous pressure, patients with high myopia, pseudo exfoliation, subluxated lenses and posterior polar cataract. How does vitreous loss present during uh, phaco emulsification? There may be a sudden deepening of the ACS, Suvira showed there is a sudden pop sign which sometimes can happen. You can have visualization of the rent, you can have peaking of the pupil and this is one of the very important signs that is a loss of followability which means that your phaco probe is eating up the, uh, the nuclear pieces and suddenly something happens, the nucleus piece is just next to the phaco probe and it stops eating. At that time, either your fluid, the suction is blocked or there's a blob of vitreous which is sitting in front of the phaco probe which is blocking the piece from coming into it. And this is a very important sign when you can't actually see the PC right. How do you manage? One must have early detection, do a good adequate vitrectomy. Now, what is a good vitrectomy settings? You must have a high cutting rate, a low vacuum, infusion to maintain the anterior chamber. The vacuum has to be low because other, and the infusion has to be also very low so that more vitreous is not hydrated and doesn't keep on coming out. Then you must do an implantation of an appropriate IOL, tight wound closure and check that there is no vitreous in the wound. Now if you see over here in this patient there is a patient with a subluxated cataract the, and the cataract is removed by uh, through a large incision over here. It's the old video which is there with a the vectus the cataract is removed because of the fear that the vitreous may go down. And here the surgeon is doing an open sky vitrectomy. This is something which should be avoided in today's day and age. If a vitrectomy has to be done with such a big incision, one must take sutures, make it into a closed chamber and then do the vitrectomy because that will achieve much better control. Now this is another patient which is there who, in whom the epinucleus is being removed and as the epinucleus is removed, the phaco probe sucks onto the posterior capsule and there is a PC tear. Now, when you go here, see there, there's a PC tear over there, the phaco is pressed. If a vibrating phaco probe comes in contact with the posterior yes. capsule, it will immediately cause a PC rent. Now, in this case, there was no, there was a PC rent initially, but there was no prolapse of vitreous in the anterior chamber. And uh, with the IA, the surgeon is doing the, removing the cortex. Now, as the cortex is being removed, you can see that the PC tear is there over here, 
this is a small circular PC tail. Here you have a PC tail now over here. Now you can do a vitrectomy from here and go through the tail and do a limited anterior vitrectomy so as to cover, remove all the vitreous which is there, which is prolapsed out and create a small pocket of, of fluid under the posterior capsule so that the posterior capsule falls back and you have a good anterior vitrectomy with the lens done, with the lens in place. Now this is another patient who was referred to me with uh, a PC tail. The surgeon didn't want to do anything more. Here you can see that there's a central, again, PC tail, a small blob of vitreous is there, and there is a lot of uh, cortex over here. There's only epinucleus, and in this case, I've decided to stain the vitreous with triamcinolone. If you look at it carefully, there's only one strand of vitreous which is peaking towards the pupil. Now, in this case, I'm using the cutter to remove the cortex. Well, the cutter can be used in two forms. In one form, you can, when you go straight down, you have cutting and suction. In most machines, if you move your cut foot pedal to the right side, you can have only suction. So in that case, it works like an IA cannula. And if there is vitreous which engages in the cutter, then you just go back to the original position and cut the vitreous off. So in this way, with a combination of cutting and sucking, you can remove the cortex very easily and the vitreous with only the cutter without using the IA cannula so that you are not pulling on the vitreous base. Now over here, if you see, there is this small strand of vitreous which is coming from here. And now I'm going to cut this strand with the cutter. This strand is going to be cut with the cutter over here. Here, I'm trying to remove the cortex. And if you stain the vitreous over here, you can, it's very easy to see these strands. Here, the strand is cut now. You can see the free flowing edge of that, that edge of the strand which is moving. So it's cut from its adhesion to the vitreous. And now a three piece lens is put. In most of these patients, I prefer a three piece lens, foldable lens to be put because in case the lens goes down by any chance, even in the later or in the post-operative mm -hmm. phase, one can easily retrieve this lens and put it back by the Yamane technique. So the same lens can be used. You don't have to open the case up, remove the single piece lens and put another three piece lens. So any case with the PC lens, I would always advise in case you're putting it absolutely in the bag, you're sure of it, then you can put a single piece lens. But otherwise, in most cases, a three piece lens would be preferable. Now this is another patient again who was referred with a lot of cortex over here, a lot of some epinucleus also, and there is vitreous which is coming out into the wound over here. Now in these patients, one has to be very careful and invariably whatever you do, there's a very high chance that a vitreous can go down. And in this case, it's always better to approach it by the past plana approach. I'm not approaching it from the anterior segment. I'm going by the past plana. And through the past plana, one can cut the vitreous very comfortably, even in the anterior chamber. But in this case, there is nucleus drop, which is there. And here you can see the nucleus is dropped. And you can remove it with either the fragmentome or just the cutter. If you have patience, a lot of cataracts with grade two and grade three can be removed with just the cutter with the, with the light pipe crushing in the nucleus into the cutter. So one must remember that whenever you have a case of vitreous loss, you must be a disciplined surgeon. You should not start shouting in the OT, where is the cutter? What is this? My cutter has not been used for, such a, for the last six months, for the last one year. You are not autoclaved it. Is this cutter good? Please don't start shouting. You must have a well-rehearsed technique as to what to do. Do a limited anterior vitrectomy, remove the cortex, and place the appropriate IOL. Thank you. Dr. Ashish, just one question. Uh, in case of a nucleus drop, what would your advice be to the referring surgeon? Should he put a PC IOL in the sulcus or, and then refer or no? Well, my advice is always if, you are, if the operating surgeon can put in a PC IOL, he must put in a PC IOL because in most of these patients, 99% of these patients, you can use a fragmentome and remove the nucleus. Only that patient in which Dr. Sandeep showed, in which he removed it by a small incision, something like that, I would be hesitant to use a fragmentome. But whatever you can speak, I can fragmentome. So you are the one who is operating. You know where your capsule is. You can comfortably put, a, if you can comfortably put a lens, please put it. But don't put a ACIOL, don't put a iris claw lens. If those two have to be done, 
Well, it can always be done later on because as the operating surgeon, later on the vitreoretinal surgeon can again assess the amount of posterior capsular support or the anterior capsular support which is there. Remember, in most cases, if you have done a good rexis and if a rexis is not nicked by the phaco probe, that rexis is still intact. It may expand as the vitreous comes out and you may feel that there, is no, there are no edges of the rexis. But once the vitreous is removed, the rexis comes back to its original size and one can always put a PCI oil. I have had some of the people putting an AC oil and referring it with the PC there, or rather with the anterior capsule there. In that case, we have to remove the AC oil and put a three-piece lens over the anterior capsule. So in most cases, if you can comfortably put a PCI oil, please go ahead and do it. Stuff, yeah. Are you ready? Are you ready? Welcome that side. Okay, sir, uh, if you can load your tongue. He's come. Yeah. He's yet to load. Just, no, see. Uh, inviting Dr. Haldi Purkar, sir. Uh, pioneer of uh, ophthalmic surgery in India. We are really fortunate to have him here and uh, it's always a pleasure to hear him talk. Always something to learn from uh, all his experiences. Thank you so much, sir, for coming here. Thank you, uh, Anaga. And please don't uh, introduce me like that. I feel very small in front of all the big people here. Okay, can I... Uh, Well, my talk today is, uh, 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 what's that? Uh, yeah, entire segment. Uh, uh. Okay. In the meantime, uh, if one sir is ready, Dr. Ashish. Uh, one more question I had regarding the vitrectomy. Like you showed the sparse planar vitrectomy in one of the cases. Now, if an anterior segment surgeon were to do that, we would always go through the limbal approach. So, do you expect an anterior segment surgeon also to do and how many of us are actually doing it? Sparse planar. No, not can do. How, how would, would you prefer doing a sparse planar than a... Yeah, so in which cases would you think a pars plana would be necessary? I think in all cases it's best to approach the vitreous from the pars plana. So I would prefer it that way. But if there is, as I showed you that one case where there was if it's strand, just a strand, just then a strand over there, that strand was delineated by the triumphs in the lawn. So at what po point would you feel that it is not right to go through the limbal approach and through the posterior, you need to go pars plana? At what point? I don't think there would be a point for because if you are seeing the edge of the posterior capsule, then you can always go down and remove the nucleus. The, the no, there is no nucleus drop. It's just a PCR. Then I so think you can go would you still go up pars planar route? Still go past, right? Depends upon your comfort. Because you are a VR surgeon. Yeah. How many of us are anterior segment surgeons? So I have a question too. What would it take for an anterior segment surgeon to learn from the problem which happens is that when the vitreous detaches, it can pull on the periphery and can cause peripheral breaks. So ideally, as a retinal surgeon, if you do a vitrectomy, you do a full vitrectomy. But very often, it is not possible to do a full vitrectomy because of various reasons. Even for a retinal surgeon, it's not possible to do a full vitrectomy. If you're doing a FACO and you have a small rent, you still do an anterior vitrectomy. What is more important in these patients, which I did not specify over there, is the post-operative management of these patients. In the post-operative period, you must have a good look at the periphery and continue to have a good look at the periphery for at least three months till the time the entire posterior hyaloid is detached. At least till three months. Initially, maybe at 15 day, 15 day intervals for a month and then maybe at one monthly intervals for at least three months more. The periphery to rule out any posterior tears. And if there's any lattice, even a small lattice, I would laser it off immediately. So that is what is more important rather 
you know, because in the post-operative period, one must look at this. Dr. Ramurthy, sir, is your any thoughts, sir, on this? Uh, case there is a rent and a large amount of vitreous is coming, if you try to do an anterior vitrectomy, that's the time the uh, entire thing expands. In those cases, I would go through a pass yeah. plana route and I think it's extremely simple. A couple of cases you have done, just go through a trocar and uh, I keep the irrigation still in the anterior chamber. Only the vitrectomy cutter goes into the uh, vitreous chamber yeah. and uh, it's a, most of these are self-sealing also and our uh, FACO machines themselves come with this too these days. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you, sir. Sir, already, okay. Uh, good morning and thank you, Anaga, again for this uh, invitation. Uh, today I'm going to speak on uh, anterior segment reconstruction. Now, anterior segment reconstruction uh, involves a huge uh, plethora of things, uh, as you can see in this picture. Uh, but we know that trauma is a major cause um, of uh, most of these uh, uh, causes, I mean, um, see cases that we see. And of course, second comes the post-surgical trauma. Post-inflammatory anti-segment changes we do see. And of course, uh, some of the most devastating things can be chemical uh, injuries, uh, which a patient remembers all the time. <clears throat> but this is something uh, which is iatrogenic where a uh, patient uh, was, uh, you know, implanted with a multifocal lens and in the process this happened and the patient was left like that and the pa patient wasn't very happy with that, obviously, so it had to be repaired. But uh, the corneal trauma leaves behind a very long-lasting da damage, whereas iris trauma is most forgiving. Lens trauma is definitely quite manageable. <coughs> but uh, chemical trauma needs urgent intervention. This is a case of extensive uh, panas, which has almost uh, caused uh, <coughs> cornea to be, uh, you know, very hazy in uh, uh, most of half part of it. And when this patient has to go in for uh, cataract surgery, your most important uh, concern is mm, the visibility so in such cases, what really helps you is staining the capsule and using a light from the side. So instead of coaxial, you'll be using an indirect light and that way you, uh, you know, take care of the scatter. And uh, the most important step, namely the rexis, can very easily be done with a simple light coming from the side. And once your rexis is done, <coughs> Managing a cataract is not really an issue. And at times when you really feel that you don't have a proper delineation, you can always resort to uh, <coughs> uh, you know, switching off the main light and going to your side light. This is uh, another case of an old corneal trauma where the patient comes with a, a very severe form of adherent leukoma where the pupil is missing. Probably the history is he had a trauma in which probably the lens has fallen off. So when I create the pupil, I realize that uh, there's only an anterior capsule with uh, uh, absorbed cataract. What I need here is uh, once the visual axis is clear, and your periphery, peripheral capsule is present. I decide to put a lens, a single piece. This was done quite a few years back when we didn't know the importance of not putting a single piece. But what I do is I put a suture through the closed haptics. And once the lens is in securely, I take the suture off. This was a case of uh, severe post uveitic uh, you know situation where again the pupil has totally closed and behind that is a severe form of uh, anterior lens fibrosis the capsule of course is fibrosed 
and in such cases the staining helps you every possible instrument that you can use like a cutter or a micro scissors and after that even the uh, nucleus is all stuck into the posture capsule and the only thing you can do here or is use a 26 number and make a puncture in the posture capsule because a cutter will not work at times you have to use scissors to make next radial cuts and then your central visual axis is cleared and then you can use a three piece lens in the sulcus this again is another case of uh, absorbed cataract which comes to you at a later date and here your concern is try and maintain as much of a rexis as possible because uh, in the part where you cannot the anterior and posterior capsule are stuck and even the iris is stuck on it so if I get even three-fourth of the bag the lens can single piece lens can easily be placed but the main concern here is the plaque which is thick but between the posterior capsule and any type of a plaque there is a potential space and the surgeon's effort should be to find the space and work in it so you are in for a surprise when you have a clear PC and you can also use your cutter to make the pupil look good in addition to looking circular and a single piece lens I venture into it because I know that uh, barring a small portion where the posterior capsule was stuck to the anterior uh, posterior surface of the iris the rest of it is present so my lens can easily go in this of course uh, there is uh, this is something that we always do the only reason I thought I would uh, show this is that there are different ways you can manage it because the capsule is uh, quite fibrous and I have no access to a femto so I use zepto to create it and later on I obviously have to fix the bag and if I feel that bag is uh, firm enough and not much of a donasis the lens is put in the bag and the iris uh, the pupil which is uh, you know traumatically uh, opened up you can always use sutures to bring it down this was an extremely old case I have probably shown it many places but this is very interesting because in this case uh, I tried to see if I can open up the bag it's very difficult to open an old fibrosed bag I did make an attempt to inject um, endocapsular ring from both the sides but I knew that it at beyond certain point you cannot push your ring because the capsule can tear so whatever portion I could remove and uh, ex expose the bag I did and then this is a case where a use of um, Amma segment in the reverse manner like you go about it the usual way and once the segment is uh, you know tied in the only difference being you don't use the convexity out but you use the convexity oh sorry uh, you know you take that central eyelet peripherally and pull on it you can't pull it too hard because the capsule can tear the back can tear but once the lens is in the lens obviously is a three piece in the sulcus and once you constrict your pupil and pull on the suture after the viscoelastic is out of the back you have a circular well centered pupil and the lens is securely placed this is an iatrogenic case but I don't know how much time do I have but uh, I'll go to the next one yeah this is a traumatically mediatic uh, pupil uh, extremely uh, um, uh, extremely uh, widely dilated and uh, the conventional pupiloplasty was probably not going to work so I thought of a uh, lasso technique <coughs> where you have to do a purse string uh, method in which you pass your suture through multiple edges uh, 
in the pupil and what you achieve is uh, you know at the end of the case you have to pull on that uh, suture and you reasonably can bring the pupil down and when I, when I looked at the post-op results, I was really uh, in for a satisfactory result because here uh, the iris is so forgivable that you can literally pull on it. And uh, uh, you know, this is what I saw uh, on the, at the end of the case, but uh, uh, on the post-op one week, the pupil looked reasonably good. And of course, this is something unpardonable. Uh, the patient comes after a week and the resident has operated and has not uh, bothered to report it to the seniors. And what you really get, okay, uh, half a minute please, or uh, maybe 20 seconds. You know, this is where uh, you first you put in your lens and after the lens is into the bag, the only uh, saving grace was the pupil was, I mean, the rexis was uh, present. The single piece is put in the bag. Viscoelastic will push the iris. Then you create a long peritomy. And what you use uh, is a technique where, uh, uh, you know, that uh, shoestring uh, method shown by Dr. Ravi, where a tenno needle is passed through a 27 and uh, get the suture uh, out and you use this needle this is a double armed first needle is brought out and it, it's uh, pulled out and kept and the second one which is threaded through 27 is used for all the future sutures and the moment that suture comes out you hold on to that with the forceps and this is repeated repeatedly after you have taken five or six of them the pupil is respectively circular and it is stuck on all the sides and then you have to remove the viscoelastic inject air put pilocarpine and tie the suture so you manage to get a respectably a circular pupil and these are some of these cases which from a routine cataract surgery give you satisfaction of having done something creative thank okay. you so much excellent surgery sir it's really uh, really a pleasure to see and lot of learning from what you have shown sir. thank, thank, you, thank so you so much. much thank you thank you so much uh, inviting our last speaker today, uh, dynamic surgeon Dr. Uh, Kumar from Dr. Rai Institute, Mumbai. Uh, good morning all and thank you Dr. Anaga to have given this opportunity to me. I'm going to talk on flags and subluxated cases. So we all know that subluxation makes it a little more tricky to do surgery. So how does flac assist us is what I'm going to show different different cases. And even if you have a small pupil and a subluxation, can we get away with it or not is what I'm going to show. So the first case, of course, is this. And this was my first flax. If you talk to the company, they say it's a contraindication. It's off the label use, et cetera, et cetera. This was a traumatic cataract, a young chap. And you can see an inferior subluxation. But I feel that everything that has a front always has a back. So the downside, of course, here is uh, the cost of the machine. But you can see the complete down here, this area, where you can see the tilt. So that's the amount of subluxation that is there you have to adjust your CCC so what I'm doing here is adjusting the level of the CCC the size of the CCC and this is what will determine the size of the CCC now this was my first case okay so it's pretty inexperienced we know that the subluxation is inferior so I wanted to keep the CCC away <clears throat> so now I'm trying to play with the size of the CCC and I made a mistake so I'm going to show you what mistake I made and how I got away with it but that mistake itself was a learning curve for me so now I'm shifting the CCC okay with the finger and moving it away from the area of the subluxation towards your incision so that's one thing I'm doing and if you move the finger in a different direction it can increase the size of the CCC so this is what I've done so this is where the subluxation is and this is what I'm doing 
and then once you freeze everything and you got a level go ahead <coughs> you can see the tilt and at the end of the procedure I got a 3.9 millimeter CCC okay so this was some sorry that was some discussion as to how it can be a 3.9 millimeter CCC so this was one mistake I had made but that can happen because it was my first case so not to worry this is a routine thing but now I've got better with it and this is how it was created now let's see this case when it happens actually in the surgery uh, this is the other case but I will go and show that also so this is a 3.9 millimeter axis away from the CCC now let's see how it looks so you can notice that it's a small CCC 3.9 millimeter here little bit of fragmentation happened there as I mentioned to you the young chap so really nothing much to worry made my incision and since a young chap I decided to go ahead remove that CCC and then do directly a bimanual IA I want you to see how the posterior capsule behaves during the bimanual IA and how it tries to follow your aspiration port and that's where we are seeing that the and look at the behavior of the posterior capsule so it tries to come with you obviously because of the subluxation that is inferior and here I'm going ahead with the bimanual IA removing the cortical matter and this you can see that the traumatic part of the subluxation was inferior the posterior capsule is adherent to the cortex and it tries to follow but with a slow gradual procedure it can be easily removed now the small CCC of 3.9 is superior of course this bag will need an endocapsular ring so we go ahead and place an endocapsular ring so I inject the endocapsular ring and now one important take home message here is that the lens when it's placed in the bag the lens will take the center of the bag irrespective of where we do our CCC the beauty of flax is that it can do a CCC of course where you want but in a routine case the flax does the CCC on the center of the lens so anatomical center of the lens so here I have not extended the CCC it's 3.9 off the center I place the lens in the bag and you will notice that the bag centers beautiful uh, the lens centers beautifully in the bag and then of course you make a nick and enlarge your CCC because you want it around 5.5 which is the functional optic of your IOL so just extending it making a nick and then going ahead so take home message here is the lens always centers in the center of the bag irrespective of where you make your CCC whether it's on the visual axis or whatever you decide or plan but ultimately it centers there so just enlarge your CCC and that's done so I'll show you one more case <clears throat> that was the other femto which I had done so you can see the subluxation in that area and that's this area is the subluxation from here to here the rest of the zonules are good we go ahead and do the flax bit of it here the other beauty is that the fragmentation happens in the area of the subluxation tool now it become better so I've done a 4.9 millimeter rexis and you can see that I can move the rexis towards the subluxation or away from the subluxation so it depends obviously you move it away from the subluxation and now we moved it away from the subluxation you can see subluxation is from here to here and I moved the rexis which is 4.9 millimeter away don't forget that this fragmentation that you're noticing is actually in the area of the subluxation which is otherwise just not possible in a routine case so go ahead and do this uh, CCC and the fragmentation and that does everything quite well let's see this case clinically as to what it looks like so as I mentioned that this is the CCC that I've done this is the subluxation there is no donesis because the rest of the zonules are pretty good and pretty intact so that's one big advantage here and make your incision and as far as removing the rexis is concerned we just pinch the rexis off from the center so that's another big advantage here and now need support for that area of the back so I made two side ports and I always pinch the rexis out and now I made two side ports and that's where I'm going to use capsular hooks so you can notice that I'm using capsular hooks and again one more thing to notice is the fragmentation has gone in the area of subluxation this is only possible because of flax otherwise it's routinely not possible this definitely there is no doubt that flax reduces the amount of phaco energy used in that eye now we go ahead and put the capsular hooks once the capsular hooks are in place go ahead and do phaco emulsification once the phaco emulsification is done we go you can see that Second. once the phaco emulsification is done one of the hooks came off yes. and the amount of bag that tried to move forward but really nothing much to worry here just fill up the bag again once the bag is filled 
uh, we go ahead and put an endocapsular ring. Yes, stop it. Another take home message is when you start placing the endocapsular ring, never ever start from the area of subluxation. That's the mistake I made here. I started placing the endocapsular ring in the area of subluxation. Uh, one more trick is to loosen the endocapsular uh, hooks uh, before you start placing the endocapsular ring. So I'm placing the capsular hooks now uh, in to hold to the bag again. Once I do that, I've got the support to the bag. And now I go ahead and put the endocapsular ring. So I, you notice that I've started placing the endocapsular ring in the area of the subluxation. But with good amount of skill, we can rotate the endocapsular ring and make sure that the area of the subluxation is well supported. And once you are in that area, just slightly loosen the capsular hook before placing the endocapsular ring inside. So that will prevent any entrapment or touching of the capsular hooks with the endocapsular ring. So that is what I've done here gone ahead and placed the endocapsular ring in the bag. And one more thing you will notice that here you will see a, a nuttle, uh, the nut of the endocapsular ring and this is the area of the subluxation. So what I'm doing here is actually rotating the endocapsular ring and making sure that the area of subluxation gets good support. So this is one take home message that never start placing the endocapsular ring in the area of the subluxation. It should always be started on the opposite side. And again, we place the IOL here exactly in the direction of subluxation to give additional support. So uh, I've got the endocapsular ring in the bag and I'll place the IOL in such a way that the haptic of the IOL gives additional support. The last case I want to show you here uh, is a damp tough case. As I mentioned here, small pupil, irregular anterior uh, chamber, angle closure attack of glaucoma, patient has prostate, heart cataract, and something else was also noted. So this is how the patient came to me. There was a PI done because of the angle closure attack. This is the sphincter atrophy. Uh, there was subluxation noted, so you can see the amount of uh, donesis that you see on slit lamp. And this is all that the pupil actually dilates. And now the patient wants a femto. So what are we going to do here? So this is the next case. This is the last one. No financial interest. So I call it challenging the challenge. Patient with irregular shallow anterior chamber, small pupil, angle closure attack of glaucoma, prostate, PI, heart cataract, subluxation, and patient wishes to have flax. So is that possible? So we did try this. This was my first case again. Now much better at it. Took the patient. I took the registration. Uh, once I put the registration, I put in a malugan ring. Uh, tricks here are that you put a little bit of GV only at the inner lip so that the BSS does not leak. Once that is done, I shifted the patient to the flax and you can see a small the ring in place. The ring is in place, We're doing a small rexis. You can see the subluxation. If you notice the anterior chamber here and the anterior chamber here are different because of the subluxation that is present. So went ahead and did flax, then did the fragmentation so remove the CCC and you'll see some donesis. It's a hard cataract going ahead and doing phaco emulsification. Now you can see that the bag is a little shaky. Went ahead and put a hook here. I used iris hook because at that stage, maybe the capsule hooks were not available, but the ideal thing to use is a capsular hook. Went ahead and did phaco emulsification. I thought I needed a little more support superiorly, put one more hook. So now I have the malugan ring in place. Uh, phaco emulsification is almost done two hooks in place, bimanual IA, remove the uh, cortical matter. When once that is done, don't forget that there was a subluxation here. So you need to put an endocapsular ring. So again, I'm going to go and put an endocapsular ring in place. Once Now I've started placing the endocapsular ring to the area opposite of the subluxation. So that's another good take home message. Once that is done, we go ahead and place the IOL again in the direction of the subluxation. So that gives additional support. So the haptic of the IOL is on the left side, and that's that is giving more support to the area of subluxation. So we have the malugan ring in place, and all of this is under topical anesthesia. So this is all quite possible with flax quite easily. So we have the malugan ring in place. Remove the hooks. The endocapsular ring has gone in. The malugan ring is removed, and you can see a little bit of air injected and patient does quite. This is the first day post-op, little bit of sad keratitis superiorly, uh, otherwise the center is quite clear. So in conclusion, flax has a big benefit in terms of CCC. Hydro procedures are made easy, small pieces of cataracts are less phaco energy, and of course in subluxation and hypermature cataracts, it has a distinct advantage over routine surgery. Thank you all for your attention.
Thank you, Dr. Kumar. That was really excellent. And I thank each one of the speakers for their wonderful talks. Thank you all so much.